now. Um, so our subject for tonight is the ninth and tenth commandments, and that will finish out the Ten Commandments for us after multiple weeks. Um, however, they're not, I, I'm not sure it's going to fill an hour just because the ninth and tenth commandments are basically just glosses on other commandments meant to reemphasize a few things. Um, All right, so the ninth commandment. Do, do, do. The ninth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Luther says, what does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we do not desire to get our neighbor's possessions by scheming or by pretending to have a right to them, but always help him keep what is his. So... I guess the first question for you to think about is how is that commandment different from the seventh commandment? You shall not steal. Well, steal is to take it away. Covet it is just to wish you had it. <laughs> True, but covet also implies that you're doing some scheming so that you can try to get it. So it's not just, a, it's not just a desire. It's also the action of trying to get it through whatever means you can. So if you're trying to get it from your neighbor, how is that different from stealing? Doesn't sound very well, different to me. This is the first time that I knew it included uh, conniving. I thought I really thought that it was just wishing you had it. You wish you had that pretty <coughs> hair that lady had yeah. or that dress she's got. Well, the, like envy or jealousy. Right. Yeah. The argument there would be that envy and jealousy will eventually lead you to try and do something about that envy and jealousy. You won't just sit there with it, okay? It's going to work in your heart, and it's going to drive you into sin to the point that you're going to make an action. You're not just going to stay there and be jealous all the time. It's just not how we work. Um, so, like I said, this is a these last two commandments are a gloss on some of the other ones. So this one is a gloss on... The seventh commandment. This is, this is reemphasizing not just that you should not steal, but that you should not even scheme to get stuff from your neighbors, because the difference here is coveting. You know, like Barbara said, is is desire, but it's also trying to get things through legal means, so that you can have them for your own. Okay, so. Just as an example, if a parishioner came to me and told me that they were behind in their mortgage payment and I knew their house was going into foreclosure and I stepped in and purchased the house from the bank right before it hit the market for foreclosure because I knew I, what the price was and I took the house for myself, that would be legal. Okay, Legally speaking, there'd be nothing wrong with that. But morally speaking, that would be awful. Okay, and that would all be a result of scheming behind the scenes to try to get something that belonged to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily stealing, it's plotting to do something against somebody, even by legal means, that eventually comes to harm them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So then it's easiest to take the ninth and the 10th commandment together. So the 10th commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his cattle or anything else that is your neighbor's. And Luther says that we are to fear and love God so that we do not tempt or coax away from our neighbor, his wife or his workers, but encourage them to remain loyal. So here again, it's another gloss on the seventh commandment, but also on 
the sixth commandment where you shall not commit adultery. So here we're talking about, you know, making sure you're not scheming to get your neighbor's wife. So, you know, what David did in the Old Testament where he, he had the, he had, uh, what's Uriah. Right? Yeah. You know, that, that would be a clear violation of this and, uh, you know, several commandments. David, he may have been the Lord's chosen, but he sure was good at breaking the commandments. <laughs> so, besides the two glosses that we talked about there, how do you think these two commandments relate to the other eight? Hi, Linda. Hey. So y'all think about that question for a minute. I'm going to recap for Linda here. So right. Linda, we were talking about the ninth and 10th commandment, but we said the easiest way to do this is to take them together because they're both essentially glosses on other commandments. So the ninth commandment is a reiteration of you should not steal, um, basically covering the fact that it's not, you know, of course it's not okay to steal, but it's also not okay to scheme against somebody to try to get something that's theirs, even if it's by legal means. So the example I used was if I found out a parishioner was, their house was going into foreclosure because they came and talked to me and I went to the bank and bought it for myself, that would be perfectly legal, but I would be causing harm to my neighbor and that would be coveting my neighbor's possessions and, and some other commandment breaking. Um, same thing with 10 where, you know, you're, it's a gloss on not committing adultery and not stealing, you know, you're not going to entice anybody to commit adultery, that kind of thing. So the question I just gave them was how did these two commandments relate to the other eight? And so far, there has been a lot of silence. <laughs> well, I'm wondering why they even wrote nine and ten. So, all right, let me let me caveat this. You remember I've said that Luther had a tendency to um, take a dim view of certain people. Um, in his explanation of this in the large catechism, he goes off on this long-winded tear about the Jews. Um, about how this was necessary to add into this into the commandments because the Jews were abusing things and and like he brings up the way you that a Jew could divorce his wife where he could just hand her a certificate of divorce and then move on to another person um, so that's why Luther says it, that this was in there the problem with Luther's argument is that he is basically taking something that happens later and applying it to something that happens before. Moses doesn't tell the, the Israelites that they can do that divorcing thing until several chapters, books, after they give the Ten Commandments. Okay, So you can't apply something that hasn't happened yet back to something that has already happened. It doesn't make any sense. So clearly that's not what God was doing. I would say that, that we talked at the beginning about how the commandments are structured, okay? The first three commandments are all about how our relationship with God is supposed to be. The last seven are all about our relationship with our neighbors. And we've seen that as it went through the, the last seven, we slowly expanded our spheres as we got farther and farther away from our personal relationships and into more expansive relationships. Okay. So you started with the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. That's your closest relationship. And, and then you added to that the government part, because that's a close relationship too. Then you shall not kill. Well, it's real personal to kill somebody. You got to be right there at them, unless you're bombing them from above. And that's another story. Um, then you shall not commit adultery. Well, there's a personal relationship too. You shall not steal. You 
Um, and then you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now we're getting out a little bit. And then you won't covet your neighbor's house. We're out a little bit further. And then you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So now we're talking about way out there on the relationship scale, right? My argument for why nine and 10 need to be in there is because God knew that people would look for loopholes. God, God knew that we'd be like, well, you know, it's not stealing if I do this, so I'm okay there. But if I just change this and change this, then I bet he's going to give me that, whether he wants to or not. Okay? God knew that we could be devious. So God threw in a few extra things there on the end just to say, hey, I'm watching. Don't be trying to find loopholes in this because it's not going to work. Okay. Now that's, that's my personal interpretation. You can take that for what it's worth, which may not be much more than the zoom video. I don't know. Um, but that, that's where I fall. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't agree with Luther's explanation. It's not because the Jews were doing something that they weren't even actually doing yet. So that doesn't make any sense. Did that answer the question? Barbara. Your question? No. <laughs> Barbara had asked a question. Yeah. Okay. And I can see that. I don't know why it was necessary to have nine and ten, why we just didn't put them together, but that don't matter. Maybe God because... likes these numbers. Yeah, we wanted ten. God didn't want one tablet to weigh more than the other. Moses and Aaron right, broke one set. Well, Sandy, you were going to say something. Even five and five. Yeah. Well, are nine and ten separated because your house represents your property, but the the woman, the maid servants aren't quite that kind of property. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably a good distinction. Um, at that time, <laughs> your wife and your maidservants would have been property, which is why later on you could do whatever you want to with them, essentially, especially the servants. Um, you know, the the wives had slightly more rights, but not much. Not much. They ran yeah. with the cow. <laughs> so. Which, I mean, I've always wondered what it what it was actually like in a first century Jewish household. I mean, I know what the laws say, but laws say a lot of things. I've never experienced a woman who was just like, oh yeah, because the law says it, I'm gonna listen to you when nobody's around. I I, I think the dynamic has been very similar all throughout history. That's funny. You didn't laugh. I'm sad. <laughs> I was afraid I'd hurt your feelings. <laughs> I started to say, are you speaking from experience? But I think I'm dumb. Yes. Oh, yes, I'm, yes. I, I know. I grew up in a house full of girls. And somehow I made God mad. And now I'm in a house full of girls. You know? It is what it is. You you learn to you learn to knuckle under. Knuckle under. Go along to get along. Your birthday is tomorrow, hon. Is it really? You better watch it. Um I'll send your stuff back. Speaking of birthdays and things that are coming up, next Wednesday I will not be here um, because I have a medical procedure that I have to deal with Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> um so what I'm going to do is I'm going to record the Bible study because that's just the introduction to the Lord's Prayer, I think, or the Creed. I don't remember. I don't have my schedule. It's at St. Michael's. The Creed. Okay. So I'll just record something for that for y'all to watch if that's all right with y'all because I'm not going to be in any shape to try to lead Bible study. <laughs> this you, not what might come out. Would you still send us the thing for us to easily get on? Yes. Okay. Well, let's see, if you're not there, 
Do we need you to do this? No. <laughs> you don't need me for anything, Barbara. I could just disappear today and you'd be fine. I'm not so sure about that. All right. You're, you're in the middle of my picture. Who's going to be in the middle of my picture if you're not there? Whoever wants to be. It'll be whoever's talking, usually. Well, we need to add him to our prayer list if he's having a medical procedure. It's just a diagnostic thing. It's not a, anything. Well, I hope you have a good result. I know. It's just because of family history. It's nothing wrong with me, so. Well, we're talking about um, adding people to the prayer list. If there's any way that y'all could pray for my friend's husband, Dan, um, he found out he's going to have to have seven weeks of radiation, 35 treatments. Been there. Um, yeah, and he's um, 76. All right, I've gone back to the prayer list. Dan, who? Last name is Konzi, K O N Z E. They're pretty upset. I imagine so. Scared. He's 76, you said? Yes. Do you know if they go to a church or anything? No, they, they haven't been because of, of his health. All right. Oh, if he needs anybody to talk to, give him my number. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I got him. Thank you. Um, How are you doing? Good. Good. All right. You look good. Thank you. <laughs> it's these Zoom cameras. <laughs> there is a setting you can change in your Zoom to make it touch up your appearance. Really? Yeah. I don't know if it works or not, but it, it is possible. We'll have to look into that. There's a setting you can change on Zoom to make it touch up your appearance. Okay, so we'll try to do this without you. <laughs> I have faith in you. How is our sister church doing? They're doing okay. I'm actually here now. So that's I really love this looks the hand hanging. Yeah. Um, quilted like it looks like it is? It is. Um, Marion Conover, who y'all, most of y'all met already, um, her sister did the the colored part of it, and then she did the binding around it. So, very nice. Okay. It is very nice. All right. So, ninth and tenth put together. The focus. One of the focuses on here is possessions, right? So your neighbor's house or your neighbor's, I don't like referring to wives as possessions, but at that time, you know, you get what it is. Well, it was at that time. Yeah. Um, same thing with, with servants and, and anything that belonged to your neighbor. So take a second, think about how do we become slaves to things? Very easily you know it's, it's it's a lot easier to resist something and leave it in the store because once you get it home you never want to part with it yeah people people get so attached to things that they end up on tv shows on tlc about being buried alive um mm -hmm. and it's not just people on tv um we have people that we know who are there um, think about how somebody, when they get attached to the idea of getting something, will do just about anything they can to get it. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're that obsessed with something, then you've made it, you've basically made it your God. So I think a part of these two commandments is God trying to set us free from that kind of stuff. 
God's trying to point out to us that the possessions are good insofar as they are a means to an end. Okay. God gives us the things that we need, the tools that we need, so that we can do what we're called to do. But they are not things for us to grab onto and never let go. They're just meant to be used. You know? I think the idea of a thrift store is actually a really good Christian concept because it shows that we do have the ability to grow out of things sometimes to pass it on and allow it to be used by others. Um, you know, so in and of itself, the thrift store is a good, a good thing because it recognizes that we don't, we don't need to be trapped by the things that we have. Maybe growing out of it is not the best way to say that. Uh, okay, so but not, I mean, clothes, yeah, but I'm just saying <laughs> you grow beyond certain things, okay? You know, that thing that meant so much to you, you know, five years ago, hopefully once you've gotten your use out of it, you look at it and I'm like, I don't need that anymore. You get rid of it, okay? You, hopefully you don't look at it and be like, I must keep this always. It's mine, Okay. One of the traps we get into, though, is we can't get rid of something because somebody who meant something to us gave it to us. Right. We can't get rid of this. I have a lot. I'm, I'm guilty of that, too, okay? My dad, you know, uh, y'all know, my dad died when I was young. I was, you know, 18 when he died. Um, and he had a couple, like, Tom Clancy books. They were in terrible shape. They were paperback books. He bought them when they came out in the 80s, okay? They were missing covers. They were missing pages. They were, they were terrible shape, you know, but I held on to them. I carried them all the way with me to Pennsylvania, even though I had new copies of them, okay? I carried them all the way to Pennsylvania, and it was only when we moved from Pennsylvania back that I finally decided I had to let them go, you know, and it was just because I finally realized you're being ridiculous, they don't they don't mean anything although it was still hard for you yeah it was still hard but i mean you know the sentimentality can work for us and also against us um another more negative example of let's see how to put this wanting what you want whether it's good for you or not is that Let's put this in broad terms. Say there is a property committee that is designing a building. Like the one you're in? No, no. <laughs> this is broad terms, so we're not talking about anything specific. Say, that, say there's a property committee that's designing a building, and they come up with a design that they really love, or that somebody there really loves and is attached to. And when they turn that design in, they are told if that design has problems, that there will going to be maintenance issues in years to come, that there are going to be um, worship issues because it doesn't make any sense on the flow, that you are um, doing things that just aren't Lutheran and, and that you need to take a step back and rethink this. And say that that property committee or whoever decides that the advice they got was no good and goes ahead and does what they want to anyway. And then say that maybe ah, 40 years down the road, a new congregation has inherited this building and all those things that they were warned about have come true. But at least it was designed the way the property committee years ago wanted, right? When you get so attached to the idea of what you want or to the possessions that you want, that you can't see reason in any way, shape, or form, then you have become essentially malignant. And I think that's a major drive behind these two last commandments. God is trying to put roadblocks in our way to keep us from getting so obsessed with things and not being able to see what we're actually here for. 
you know it's not meant to be stuff you're not supposed to store up treasures on earth you're supposed to store up treasures in heaven if you spend all your time storing up treasures on earth you might not get to heaven and you can't take them with you <laughs> by the same token change is very difficult for people and a lot of times that involves things yeah, yeah. of course i don't have a problem with change you know that <laughs> <laughs> but it is it, we are creatures of habit yeah and So, so, given what we've just talked about, how does God use these commandments to protect us from ourselves? All of them or just the last two? Just the last two. We're going to kind of broad picture it in just a minute. So that we would be content with what we have. Yep. And I think spend some time figuring out what's legal versus what's moral. You know, just because something's legal doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. You know, it might be legal for me to take over something. It might not be right for me to do it. Any other thoughts on these? Go ahead. Example of people in power that have knowledge of something and they take action to benefit their own pocketbook because they are privy to knowing something. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's the whole reason we have like insider trading laws. Yeah. Okay? Because it, and it, it's funny that we would make a law when it comes to money. But when it comes to just taking something from a poor person, we're fine with that. Okay. But that whole insider trading law was all because somebody got mad that somebody else made money in a way that they didn't like. And so they, they did something about it. You know, that's just like, it's the dumbest example in the world. But did you know in South Carolina that it is a misdemeanor to be caught with a small amount of marijuana, but it is a felony to be caught with the same amount of something you claim is marijuana that is not marijuana. What? Like so oregano? If you, caught, <laughs> if you get caught with a, a dime bag size bag of oregano and you're trying to sell it as marijuana, it's a felony. Okay. But if you were trying to sell that as marijuana, it's only a misdemeanor. You get a ticket. <laughs> That's in South Carolina. That's in South Carolina. And the only reason I can think of for that is that sometime, at some point, some state senator went to go buy something and got very upset when he found out it was oregano. <laughs> well, that's worse than some of our other blue laws. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's all kind of interesting ones still on the books. I mean, for instance, if you're driving your car and you come to a four-way stop, you are legally required to get out of your vehicle and fire your rifle into the air to warn oncoming horse traffic that a car is coming through the intersection. So make sure you do that the next time you come to a four-way stop. Lord have mercy. I'm guilty of that. <laughs> My pastor told me to do it. <laughs> As you get run over by the guy that didn't stop. Yeah. I don't know now. You pull out the rifle, he'll probably stop. <laughs> he'll probably turn around. <clears throat> All right. So let's kind of broad picture this for a second. Okay. 
So what does God say about all these commandments? God says immediately after the Ten Commandments, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third generations and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. We reckon that means. Well, one thing it means is something I've always had a problem with is he's, he's holding children. Uh, he's punishing children for what their parents did. I don't think it's actual children. I mean, we're all someone's child, but we're not children. Yeah. I don't think God actually, I, I think this is more a figure of speech. Um, it, the, the Hebrew on it is a little bit different than the English. And so it, it's, it's a way of, of trying to show that God's love, steadfast love endures forever, but God's anger is real but does not last forever. Does that make sense? But it lasts several generations. It lasts for a while. I mean, you know, God sent the prophets to warn Israel time and time again, turn around, you know, you're getting in trouble. Turn around, turn back to God. And when they didn't listen, they got shipped off to Babylon. You know, they eventually came back because God eventually relented. But it didn't change the fact that they got shipped off to Babylon or even closer to the Ten Commandments. I mean, right now, everything's okay. God's giving these Ten Commandments. God's really kind of yelling these Ten Commandments at the people, which is, you know, terrifying to them, which is why they were like, Moses, hey, hey, he sounds angry. You go talk to him. Um, but, you know, everything's okay right now with the people. As soon as Moses goes up that mountain to go talk to him, <laughs> they're going to make a golden calf, you know, because it's like in one ear and out the other. And they're just going to like, and they're going to corrupt Aaron into, do the, into doing this for him, you know, which you would think Aaron would be like, did you not hear the loud voice just now? The, 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 the lightning and the thunder? But it's just, it's the way it is, right? God gets angry at them. God gets angry with them a number of times in the wilderness, and that's why they spend so much time in the wilderness. You know, it's like I well, he, yeah, he does smite some of them. Um, it's like I told you in Hebrew, Hebrew words or letters, numbers. That's what I'm looking for. Hebrew numbers also have word meanings. So forty years might mean forty, or more likely, it means as long as it took. So we know they were out there for a long time, at least long enough for one generation to die off. That could have been longer than 40 years. You don't know. But God did eventually relent. God did eventually let them into the promised land. So God's anger can be kindled, and it does last for a while, but it's not eternal. The only thing that's eternal about God is God's love. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, if you, I don't know how many of you have the little book. Do any of you have it? Yeah. I do. I have that, but I'm not using that one. All right, so I'm just going to read this, this one section here. So what does God say of all these commandments? There is a slack and false version of the Christian faith holding that God's promises to forgive our shortcomings means that we're relieved from the consequences of our behavior or exempt from punishment when we violate the Ten Commandments. This final word added to the Ten Commandments tells the truth. Our behavior does have unavoidable consequences. What we do with our loyalties, our actions, and our bodies matter deeply to God. The Ten Commandments are a summons to commit ourselves and our behaviors to the cause of life. They are a call to a rigorous and strenuous vitality. 
they warn us that to stray from, the, from their ways is to fall into destructive error. More than that, however, the Ten Commandments are ten words that offer us life rich beyond imagining. They tell us of a God who speaks directly to us and who makes an unbreakable promise to care for us. They protect our ability to hear and speak to God. They locate us in the human community and show us how to trust God and love one another in the same way that God trusts and loves each one of us. Anything but a fistful of harsh thou shall nots, the commandments are actually ten words of life. They what? Actually what? Ten words of life. Ten words of life. So the argument they're trying to make with that, that conclusion, basically, is that these are really easy to look at as rules that we have to follow. They are commandments, okay? I mean, they are what they are. But the intention behind them is not the same intention when I give Lexi rules, which is to make her do something that she ne doesn't necessarily want to do. Okay, the intention behind them is to give boundaries to us as God's creation so that we can stay on the right side of our relationship with God. Okay? When we get out of whack in that relationship is when things start falling apart. When we start wandering around in the wilderness, yes, or when we get exiled to Babylon or, you know, or when the Romans invade or when the termites come, I don't know. Um, Honey, you can't stick things on there. It doesn't stick like that. Please stop using my sticky pads. I need them. I use them. Okay, hon. Um, so, when we are able to live as closely to these commandments as we can, because we're always going to fall short, we're always going to mess up, it opens the door for a very remarkable faith and for a very fulfilling life. It allows us to live in a good relationship with God and with our neighbors and with ourselves. It helps us be the people God calls us to be. You know, we talked about before that Jesus says the two greatest commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, which is Deuteronomy 6, 4, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the gist of these commandments. One, two, three, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. It's, you know, four through eight, four through 10, love your neighbor as yourself. They're not easy by any stretch of the imagination especially when you factor in Luther's explanations of them because he expands half of them out so wide that you can't even understand where it's all coming from. Like, so get out of that tea. That's your mommy's. But if you're able to even live close to them, then you can pretty much go before the Lord and like, I lived a pretty good life. I didn't live a perfect life, but I lived a pretty good life. What are your thoughts about that? I had never thought about the two later commandments really being a synopsis of one through ten until you explained it. Hello, darling. Uh, and I've been told a lot of times that one through 10, you no longer had to follow because you had the other two, which I don't believe. I never did believe. There is, uh, so you know what a heresy is, right? Yeah. So, Heresy is kind of a, a broad thing in that the people who define what a heresy are, whoever's in charge at the moment. So heresy can change depending on where you're at. Um, like the Eastern Orthodox Church still considers the Lutheran Church to be her heretics. 
they would they would just assume burn Martin Luther is really work. Um, heresy is defined by who whoever's in charge. But there was a an early heresy in the church called antinomianism. And antinomianism basically said that the law has been abolished completely, totally, it's all gone. The only thing we have to do is believe in Jesus and everything's gonna be fine. Okay. And Luther eventually gets accused of being antinomian because it's real easy to look at his saved by grace through faith alone and say, okay, well, if Jesus has done it all, I'm done. I can do whatever I want. Jesus is just going to forgive me and I get in. Okay. But what the church said in the early days and what Luther said was that God gives this to us as, as a guide for living our lives. This is God's good work. It's not some evil thing that was handed down from some mean deity that just like smushing people when they got on his nerves. Okay. This is God's good and holy word. It's words of life meant for us. This is words that came from the same God who created the world. Okay. So it's not something that we can just blatantly ignore. It's stuff that we need to use as a guide, as a curb to make sure we don't get out of whack. Now, do I think you need to um, spend a whole bunch of time worrying about the, the commentary on the law that became Orthodox Judaism? So, you know, can, are you allowed to eat cheeseburgers and can meat and dairy touch? I don't think you need to worry too much about that, okay? But when God says, don't kill, I think you probably should take that seriously. Um, when God's, and caveat there would be, if you're in danger, you know, I think there's something to that. But when God says, you know, don't steal, that's important. Pay attention, you know, because when you don't, you end up in trouble. God doesn't want you to be in trouble. God wants you to live a good life, which kind of sounds a little bit like Joel Osteen, but that's, that's not where we're going. Please don't go there. <laughs> Although, if, if you follow the the two commandments that Jesus gave, you would you would automatically be following these ten. You would. You would probably need to spend some time looking at them just to figure out what that looked like. Because you know, I can love my neighbor while I'm stealing his house. Okay? No, you can't. Sure. I can no. love the I can love the fact that he's allowing me to steal his house. I mean, no, 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 no. Whoa. That's that loophole. Scary <laughs> Very nice, Lexi. So I mean, I think I think Jesus is right in saying that these are the two broad strokes. But you know, it's wrong for us to, and we do sometimes ignore the Old Testament. You know, a lot of times, in especially in worship. The Old Testament gets, you know, a little portion of the service. We read an Old Testament reading. You know, this week it's from Isaiah. There's no context around it. We just read a little portion from Isaiah. We have no idea what he's talking about. And we move on to the psalm. And then we're into Paul's letters and then the gospel. And I preach on the gospel. Most of the hymns are based on the gospel. And we move on with our lives. You know? Because of their names. Well, yeah, maybe. But I can pronounce their names. Some of them um, have very various pronunciations. I yeah, never I, could figure out why do all the women in the Bible have names you can pronounce? Maybe they wanted to be remembered. Maybe so. So, I don't know. I mean, you know, well, it depends, too, because, like, Sarah's original name was Sarai, and that's kind of a weird name. But no, it's not a limelack. <laughs> or like, worse. You like you don't like Meshad Shadrach and a big nigga? Well, I've heard those enough that I just about know them, but there's a lot <laughs> there's a lot of those I've we can... no idea how to pronounce. Y'all y'all know Mike Wood, right? 
Mike, Who? Mike Wood. Yeah. He used to be yeah. the associate pastor at Monk's Corner United Methodist. Right. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego is his favorite example. If he didn't bring it up at least one time in class every week, we knew he was sick or something was wrong. So we actually got to a point where we were keeping score to see how many times he would bring it up and we would give him his running total at the end of the week. <laughs> well, actually, wasn't Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, uh, didn't they also have other names that were like, you know, one set was Hebrew and the other set was... Probably. But, and but, they were worse. They were harder to pronounce. Right, but if you, if you know Hebrew, and I do, they're not that bad. Um, but if you think about Peter... So Peter's actual name is Simon. His nickname is Peter, which in Greek is Petros, which means rock. But he which also has he also has an Aramaic nickname, Kephas, and then a Hebrew nickname, which is Cephas, which is what Paul calls him, because Paul doesn't like calling him Peter. <laughs> it, it's a very nice one. So I mean, you know, you can have multiple names. Honestly, Jesus is probably a don't don't lose your faith here, but Jesus is probably a Greek mistransliteration because there is no J sound in Greek. There's only a Y sound. So the and there's no J sound in Hebrew. So in Hebrew it's probably the root is probably Yeshua, which is also the root of Joshua which means God saves. So it's possible we call Jesus by the wrong name. But he knows who we're talking about. So that's why I said don't lose your faith. All right, so what other thoughts on the Ten Commandments? Is there anything we want to go back and touch on? I think we're pretty learned up. <laughs> learned up. <laughs> so on Sunday, you're all going to be able to stand before the congregation and repeat the Ten Commandments. Right. As long as it's in the bulletin. <laughs> I'm good, John. <laughs> Where do you see grace in these Ten Commandments? Grace? Yep. I think the grace comes into play with when the commandments are written, God knew none of us would be able to keep this law. So basically the laws teach us what we should and should not do. And then later on in the Gospels, God shows us what he's done and still does for our salvation. Yeah. Luther would say there's three uses of the law. The first use is the civil use, which helps keep everybody in order and keeps law and whatnot. The second use is the, and that's, that's technically the curve. The third or the second use is the mirror, which helps you see that you on your own are not perfect and that you need help. You need a savior. Um, the third use is kind of debated. Um, normally we just talk about the two, but the third use is um, kind of a, a amalgamation of the two. It's, something that helps you stay straight once you know who your savior is and helps you point yourself to the savior. So, I mean, there's, there's definitely a large measure of grace in that these commandments help you stay pointed where you need to be. I would also say there's grace in the fact that they exist at all. Okay. It's not like God didn't know what was going on down there at the, the base of the mountain while he, Moses was up there getting the tablets. Okay. It's not like, it's not like God didn't know that was going to happen. Um, 
the fact that they exist at all shows what a loving and caring God we have. Because if God didn't care about us, it would be very easy for God to have just cast us aside and not given us any way of staying straight. Okay? We could have just been left to our own devices and, and then found out at the end of times that that wasn't a good plan and that we were going to be hot for all of eternity. You know? Well, I mean, he actually cared enough to do two sets of tablets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What? I need one. It's because the air conditioner is on different units. So, what other thoughts do you have? Someone has thoughts on this. I have an unrelated question. Go ahead. Um, on the congregational meeting, is there anything, any provision for a proxy vote? Currently, yes. Okay. And what would I have to do to facilitate that? Madam Secretary? Madam Secretary? Yeah. You, you keep and tend the Constitution. Constitution. <laughs> The Constitution says, and I may not, I may not have it exactly straight, that if uh, we can send someone to get the vote from people that are at home sick, we've done other. We have we have bit that quite a bit and called on the phone. Uh, but I know it says you go to the home and get their vote. Yep. If I'm not mistaken. Take advantage of that while you can. Does it not say a council member? Yes. Yes, it does. So but does it doesn't say secretary. No, it doesn't say secretary. <laughs> so um, part of the reason if you remember, y'all wanted to know why the Senate was saying that we should not have that provision in there. Um, and no, I still don't have an answer to why they approved it way back when, when they did. I, I can't answer that question. But I've gotten part of the answer. The legal question is still outstanding. But the, the first part of the answer is because of Robert's rules. So Robert's rules defines a, a, meeting as people gather together in the same place who are able to make comment and hear comment and vote together. Plus, if someone cast an absentee ballot, like say Linda cast an absentee ballot for the partnership, and then during the congregational meeting, we amend the motion from council, her ballot would no longer be legal because she did not have an opportunity to speak for or against the motion to amend and she does not have the ability to vote on that motion. The same would be true if you had somebody who was running for an office and somebody was nominated from the floor, their ballot would not be legal because they didn't have an opportunity to vote on that person. But through Zoom, she can see the meeting for right now. I'm not, I'm not trying to bend or overstep. Oh. So, I'm just saying we've got some some technology that allows full scope. And they said that you can do that. However, Robert's Rules makes you find some way of recording their vote and allowing it to be secret. So I'm not sure how we do that on Zoom. But we don't. What we do is we can mail her a ballot and then you leave a blank at the bottom if anything comes up on the Zoom that she sees, she can comment on that and still cast her vote and it would be sealed. We would need to supply a ballot and an envelope, so that way it is secret. Yeah. I mean, either way, it doesn't matter right now just because it's in the Constitution and that's what we're operating under. And there's nothing that specifically forbids it in the model Constitution, which is the only thing that could supersede ours 
for an, uh, for the case of making an illegal ballot or legal vote. Um, and nobody's going to challenge us anyway. So as far as we're concerned right now, we just do it by regular procedure, which is a council member gets you a ballot, Linda, and you vote. Um, but I will have a Zoom link up during the meeting. So right after the worship service, the Zoom link will go live so that you can see what's happening during the meeting and hear what's happening during the meeting. Okay. So do I vote before the meeting? I think technically you kind of have to. I okay. think that's what the Constitution says. Okay. Because it's I think the Constitution says before the meeting date, the ballots have the absentee ballots have to be turned into the to the parish um, coordinator. Okay. All right. So I'm still as far away as I was. What should I do? I mean. I don't see any any place where we're going to amend the motion. So, if you're able to be on the Zoom meeting, great. But I would still you're still going to get a ballot beforehand, and you just vote that way. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Anything else? Any other questions, comments, concerns? You managed to drag it out to eight o'clock. <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> I, th I think it's, for me, it's been informative. Yeah. I, thought, I thought it was a very good study. And hopefully the, the creed and the Lord's Prayer and everything will continue that pattern. Because there's a lot in those too. So well, quite honestly, this is the one normal thing we can look forward to on a Wednesday. Okay. <laughs> what, John? <laughs> you said you're not normal. <laughs> I did not say that, Miss Barbara. <laughs> what I was saying is that meeting on Wednesday night even if it's on zoom it's one of the one normal things that happen on this day because it happens at the same time every wednesday yeah okay i guess <laughs> i'm just referring to what type of days we have the rest of the week where things blow up constantly right with all this other stuff going on so you're saying this is an anchor for you in a manner of speaking yes because i know on wednesday nights come seven o'clock there's a slot and it's filled which means the television gets turned off there's no negative nellies dancing across the tv telling me about coronavirus I can do that if you like. <laughs> All right. Why don't we close with a word of prayer? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Almighty and gracious God, you've given us these commandments so that we can not only hear your voice, speak to us out of your word, but also so that we have a guide, a roadmap for a good life, a fulfilling life as your disciples. We ask that you help us keep these commandments in spite of the brokenness around us, among us, and in us. Help us to be mindful of them. Help us to look at situations more closely to think how they might be related to these guideposts you've given us and help us continue to share our love and our faith with those around us just by being the very people that we are. We come to you, Lord, as our God. We come in fear and love and in trust. We ask you to forgive us for our shortcomings and to help us enter more fully into the abundant lives that you intend for us and for all people to enjoy. 
Help us be the disciples you call us to be. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, who led us and taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. Y'all have a good night. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Well, Pastor, you have a day. Happy birthday to you. I have a nice birthday yes. tomorrow. Happy birthday. Yes, happy they started, birthday. They wanted to schedule the, the procedure for tomorrow, and I was like, <laughs> no, that's, that's not how I'm spending my birthday. Pat. Well, you have a good one. I'll you. You'll be 34. Tomorrow I will be 34. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've got age before because it was the year I was born. Now I don't know if I'll be able to remember it as you grow older. Okay. <laughs> if you don't remember how old I am, I'm not going to remind you. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Good night. Not how old you are. Good night, Lexi. Good night, Lexi. <laughs>